How will traditional alliances change in the aftermath of the Arab uh, revolution? Yeah, uh, let me yeah, give a, some sort of a pessimistic pictures which could happen actually after this Arab revolution. We had two failed states, or semi-failed states at least, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yemen now is, is really could be the third one. I don't know about Libya. I don't want to upset my friends here. <laughs> so uh, w what it means a failed state? A failed state equal to Al-Qaeda. Where Al-Qaeda established, if you look at Al-Qaeda, established where failed states are created. We used to have one address of Al-Qaeda. It is Tora Bora. Tora Bora Main Square. <laughs> Tora Bora High Road, the third cave in the left. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many addresses of Al Qaeda we do have? This is correct. It was Al Qaeda was only in Afghanistan, only in Afghanistan, Tora Bora. So, now we have Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, the original. We have Al Qaeda in Pakistan. We have Al Qaeda in Yemen. We have Al Qaeda in Iraq. We have Al Qaeda in Somalia. We have Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. So imagine if tomorrow we have Libya as a failed state, or we have Syria as a failed state, what will happen? So this is, this is actually what, what is worrying me. How to counter this? A true democracy. If you have a democracy, real democracy, in our part of the world, where people express themselves freely, without outside intervention, this is the best medicine, actually, to fight Islamic radicalism. If we let, actually, this Arab Spring or Arab Revolution or Arab uprising to bear fruits and to encourage it to bear fruits without, actually, controlled changes, that's you know, without, you know, changing regimes by military forces, which could be counterproductive. If we do so, I think that it would be, we will have a much better future. But unfortunately, I mean, that's not totally realistic. I mean, whether we like it or not, the U.S. and the Western powers are always going to meddle. I mean, sometimes there's good meddling, but most of the time it's bad meddling historically. But I think, I think that's just the way it's going to be. America is always going to have interests in a place like Egypt. And the U.S. does not want the future Egyptian government to cancel the peace treaty with Israel. And that's why I think the new Egyptian government won't cancel the peace treaty with Israel. And even if we look at the rhetoric of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood has been you know, somewhat ambiguous about this, but for the most part they're saying we'll respect past international treaties. We have examples of democracies in the Arab, <laughs> uh, sorry, not the Arab world, the Middle East already. I mean, Turkey. Turkey is um, as democratic as they come in the region, and there's actually a somewhat Islamist government in charge. Has that been the end of the world for the U.S.? No, the U.S. has still found a way to work with Turkey. Iraq is somewhat of a democracy right now, and it's led by what? A Shia Islamist party. But the U.S. has still found a way to work with Iraq. So I don't think it's a zero-sum game. There's ways for the U.S. and other Western powers to coexist with an Arab world that is democratic and independent, right? No. It's not right. <laughs> Look what happened when, when after flotilla. Look what happened. Turkey, it used to be you know, the darling of the West, simply because it maintained good relation with Israel. And it's, you know, that it's Islam is uh, light, uh, like Coca-Cola Coca light. It was light Islam. So it was actually, it was fantastic for the West. Since flotilla, look at the American, the chart of the American-Turkish relationship. You know, it is deteriorating. They canceled military maneuvers with Turkey. There is a lot of pressure on Turkish government now, simply because you know, it has started to take just a just little bit of criticism toward the Israelis and uh, maintaining good relation with Hamas. Um, just a couple of comments to add to this. I think uh, amongst the lessons we can draw from Turkey, I think two in particular matter here for understanding why Turkey should be, in some ways, a, a model for other countries to look at in the region. Two things that Turkey has that I think we should, in the Arab world, pay great attention to. It has a largely independent foreign policy and a political establishment. Turkey does not depend on the US for a security umbrella or security guarantees. The second lesson from Turkey is Turkey has a, 
a complex, diversified, and a large economy that has been doing uh, fairly well. You've got your economic base, you've got your political security independence, you can emerge on the world stage, especially in a region where you don't have regional powers that can in fact meet some of what Turkey's uh, basis for its influence and its role in the world have. Final point, just to address the question very, very quickly, you asked about alliances. I actually think the Arab Spring is going to create new alliances within the region. Uh, these alliances are, uh, are uh, some of them are maybe clear to us. We saw recently the GCC reaching out to Jordan and Morocco to perhaps invite them into their orbit, raising a lot of questions as to what are the motives there. Could this work? Could this not work? Uh, I'll be the last one to admit this, but I have to be honest and say this to you. Uh, six months ago, I think uh, if somebody had asked me personally, where do you draw inspiration in the Arab world for Arabs? I would have pointed to the Gulf. I would have pointed to Dubai. I said the best thing that has happened to us in the last 10 years is in fact here. The economic achievement, the prosperity, the modernity. I think in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, it's difficult to say that. And one would have to say at least that on paper, the inspiration, the ideas that will shape the Arab world, where Arabs are going to be looking to for emulation, for, for role model, for, uh, for a, a measure of what they would like to, to achieve, is likely to be more and more focused in Egypt and, uh, and Tunisia and in the countries that are going through this political change. I think alliances that will emerge in, in especially the, these developing uh, democracies will simply be based on national interests. So why is Egypt reaching out to Iran? Because Iran a, is a large power in the region and, and it needs to have good relations with everyone in the region. What that means though, going back to the United States, is that there is competition for influence. And one thing that I kept hearing when I was in Washington a few weeks ago is, is, is the fear of that competition. Who is going to have influence on the Middle East now after America has dominated the region for so long? Is it going to be China? Is it going to be Iran? Is it going to be Turkey? And I think that that competition is very healthy. So the fact that these new alliances are possibilities now hopefully will again make it in America's interest. And I go back to that. I, I have no hope of any country ever acting according to ideals. It will always only act according to its interests. So let's incentivize good behavior. How do you do that? By creating competition. So if the United States understands that the people now have a say in, in general, hopefully that, that develops into something robust. And when they do, they will want alliances with those who stand with their interests. And that should help. The fact that China is emerging, the fact that China wants influence in the Middle East, the fact that they're sending their people to Middle Eastern countries and learning Arabic and, and forging these relationships is a good thing because it can help the United States behave in a way that is compatible with the interests of the people.